Okay. Hi guys, welcome again. Uh, the topic of uh, today's video is the subject of training intelligently. Uh, how to get the best use out of your training time, assuming that you have some of course. Uh, I've talked often in other videos, I've mentioned um, as part of other videos, I've often talked uh, about uh, certain aspects of training intelligently. Uh, in this particular video what I want to do is bring most of them together into one place so you get an idea of what I would talk or what I would think would be an intelligent, or what, intelligent way to approach your training. And hopefully <laughs> the way that I try and approach my training uh, based on what I've learnt over the years, um, some of the things that I've, I've done right, some of the things that I've done wrong. But uh, this, uh, what I've got down here that I want to share with you today um, is more or less a, um, a distillation of everything I've learnt about trying to train intelligently to get the most out of your training in the minimum amount of time. Um, for myself, the reason why this for me was quite important, as uh, some of you have, may have read in the past from uh, stuff on my website, is that from my previous sort of health issues where I found it very difficult to train for any length of time without getting very, very tired, it meant that I really had to try, I didn't have a lot of time to just cover everything and hope that along the way everything I needed to do would get done. Um, I couldn't spend three hours in a, in a session hoping to cover everything somehow. Instead, I had to take maybe an hour and make sure that I got the absolute most value out of that hour. And uh, what I'm going to share today is, is really just the, the things that I think about in order to get the most out of my particular training time. So let's uh, get to it. Now, first thing uh, that I'd like to get you to think about, and it applies to a lot of table tennis stuff, is usually the why. Okay? Why, are, why are we training? Or why are you training? And apart from the obvious reason, which is hopefully you're training in order to improve your table tennis game, um, there is also one other aspect, which is hopefully you're also training in order to improve your training partner's game. Um, you may have many training partners, uh, or if you're at a club, you may just be hitting with whoever random persons uh, at the other end. But regardless of that, you should also have in mind that this training is, is a two-way thing. Somebody at the other end is doing things to help you do your training, and you, from your part, owe it to them to make sure that when he's feeding you the ball, you're working hard, you're not wasting his time. And that when it's his turn to do his training, his training if you're then going to help him, you do your very best to help him. Then hopefully you both get better and everybody benefits. So just keep that in mind. But for most of the purposes of what I'm talking about today, the reason why we're training here is we're trying to improve our table tennis game, uh, some aspects that we've identified in order to hopefully help us either win more matches or to improve a particular aspect that we want to work on. Um, so that we have more fun. Uh, and that's probably as, as much that you need to keep in mind about it um, as, as you need right now. Okay, now, having said that, the next step, um, part two, is okay, what do we need to train? Okay, so when we're looking at it and I'm coming in, I'm saying, okay, I've got a limited amount of time. Okay, what do I need to train? You know, in that hour that I've got, what am I going to do? There's really... Um, there's more or less two aspects that I'm thinking about when I'm approaching a particular training session or working out a training plan for the next few months. Okay? There is the things that I'm trying to work on that will improve my game um, immediately or in the very, very short term. Um, and we're talking kind of days, um, weeks here, you know, very, very quickly. Uh, the quick fixes, um, as, it were, as it was. Simple, usually simple, but quick, easy, and immediate. Okay, um, an example of something like that, a, a quick fix, would be perhaps um, just learning, say, on your forehand um, return of serve, learning the ability to forehand flick the ball. 
and bringing that stroke in. Okay, just just one particular stroke. Just say off a off an easy ball, an easy topspin ball. Just learning to flick. Okay, that can be a pretty quick fix because as long as you're picking an easy ball to do, it won't take you very long to learn the technique of say maybe not changing your bat angle, but just going in and doing a little mini loop flick or drive flick as your case may be. A quick fix, okay? So that's that's one aspect of the game, something that can improve your game right there, right now. Now the other side of what you may want to work on is stuff that will help you play better over the long term. Okay, and we're now talking perhaps um, many weeks, months, hopefully not years. I think you know if it's going to take you years to learn um, something, then that's maybe it's either too difficult or you're not clear about what you're doing. But certainly something that maybe you could say might take a couple of months, um, three months to bring into your game. Now, good examples of that might be um, specific difficult serves. Um, might take um, a little while, two or three months to get comfortable. Big technique changes um, may take months. Um, for me, when I changed my grip was a good example. When I went and stopped trying to use a big forehand grip on, on my forehand and then changing the grip to a backhand grip on the backhand, that took months. It wasn't a, a two-day fix. It took me a good three months to get comfortable. But in the long term, it made me play better. Um, a current example would be, um, as you've heard me talk about, is my current disability to use the forehand generating for power from the waist. Okay? That's not something that you pick up in a day. It improved in a day you know, or two, it got better, but I've still got a long way to go. And, we've, and I'm talking a couple of months before I get to the stage where that's automatic without a lot of thinking about. But it's something I'm going to keep working on. Another quick example is just that, again, that ability to flick the ball on the backhand with the long pips, that new stroke that I'm trying to work on. I'm trying to use that against backspin balls, topspin balls, float balls. That's not going to be something I'm going to master in a couple of days or a week. We're talking a few months. So long term. So you've got some short term quick fixes that are quick and easy and some long term things. Okay. Now both of these, when you're what we're talking about with both of these kind of areas, what I also try and keep in mind with it is that for both of these things, what I'm wanting to do should be something that's going to help me win more matches. It's going to help me play better table tennis and win more matches. That's my guiding principle because for, for me, I'm playing competitively and I want to win more matches. Okay, that's part of how, what I find fun. If your focus isn't just playing to win, but it's playing to say, um, play to a certain style, uh, you want to play more like juicy hook, you want to, you want to chop on the backhand and counter loop on the forehand um, or something like that. So if you're trying to say play to an ideal style, um, or you're trying to master a particular shot and that's your challenge over the next few months is you really, really want to learn to counter loop back from the table. So, okay? That may not improve your overall game. Okay? You may not get better because of that, but you may enjoy yourself doing it and you may have a lot of fun. Okay? But if it's not actually your style, even though you're working and having fun doing it, it may not make you win more games. But if you're happy, then, then that's fine. You can still approach your training in order to help you do better at that particular shot. But I guess for most people, we have more fun if we're winning rather than losing. So I'm going to come from the position that what I'm talking about here is from the point of view of let's work on stuff in that small amount of time we do have available. Let's work on things that are hopefully going to be the best bang for our buck, the best return on our time. Let's work on stuff that's going to help us win more, more matches more easily. And um, that's what, when I'm working out what 
routines I want to do, what techniques I'm trying to learn, what I have to bring into my game. That's usually what I've got in mind. That's what I'm thinking of. What is this going to make me win more easily? Um, is it going to work in with the rest of my game? If it's not, well, then it's, it's not really a lot of point um, me doing it. A good example of which was as a defender. Uh, I never, I was always more of a traditional defender, chopping a lot and occasionally um, counter-attacking off of my opponent's push. I never really counter-looped back from the table if my opponent looped the ball. I was never really a, a modern defender style of counter-looping. Yet in training, I often did spend a lot of time trying to develop that stroke. And I never used it in matches. I had fun trying to develop it, but in terms of was it a good use of my time, um, not really, because I never used it. It, was not, it wasn't useful for my style. Um, it's useful more now because I'm getting a chance to occasionally use that now. So it's, things have changed. My style has changed. Therefore, I have to reevaluate what's useful versus what's not. But that's a good example of um, something that basically I, I was mistakenly working on, wasting time on, that I could have been doing something more useful with. Okay, so having thought about it, this is again what we were, we were talking about and I've talked about in other videos. You go in, you evaluate your strengths, you evaluate your weaknesses, and you decide on, okay, what's the most pressing things that I need to work on? Do I need to improve a strength? Do I need to bring a weakness up that I'm losing a lot of points on? And you have to decide. And if you've only got, say, an hour or two a week, you know, of training time available, which is not uncommon for a lot of people. Some people may not even have that and may only just go down to a club and play. But assuming, say, you have an hour or two a week um, to work on some training, then you're not going to be able to do train six things. You know, can't do it. Not, not well. Focus on, if you've only got an hour or two, focus on two things. Maybe, maybe three, you know, if you've got two hours. But I would generally say about two things would be not, not bad. That would be um, enough so that you don't get too bored. Um, but that way you could basically say, okay, I'll work on a strength, you know, and I'll work on my weakness that really needs propping up that I'm losing a lot of points in matches. So you can work on a strength and a weakness. And, and that would be pretty good, I think, in terms of making good use of your training time. Okay, so, having kind of said that, how would we allocate that time? Okay, and a typical one, let's, let's talk about maybe we've got an hour session because then it's easy to scale that up to two hours or more. If you had an hour session to, of time to train per week, what would be your most effective ways for a lot of people to improve your game? Well, firstly, would be serve, serve, return. You get big dividends from training serve and serve return. Okay? Um, especially if you've got a partner who's willing to train it with you because you, if you do serve return with a partner, you can get very good immediate feedback about whether these serves are effective. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting a bucket of balls and just serving. You'll, you'll improve the technique and be able to get the ball where you want. But actually doing it with somebody at the other end Returning the ball gives you a much better idea about whether that serve is actually working in terms of being hard for your opponent to return. Um, is it hard for him to pick the variations? Does it work and does it produce the type of return back to you that you want? Now, does he flick it back? Does he push it back? Does it go in certain directions that you want and expect? So although, yeah, you know, Solo serving is great. It's even better if you can serve to a partner and be working on that kind of stuff. If I had to do it with, and I didn't have a partner who wanted to do a lot of serve and serve return, what I would then do is in all our training drills, I would try and start with a proper serve so that, say we're just doing, I don't know, um, just a basic block, he loops, I block, when I serve, I would try and serve him, you know, maybe a long serve, 
so that he can loop it, but I would serve it with all my different variations, getting some practice on my serving, and I would take note of how he's returning it. Is he having trouble with any particular ones? So there are, there are ways around that. But definitely, I think in, in that one hour, I would think a minimum minimum of 15 minutes serve and serve return. Okay, Probably up to an extreme um, of 30, of almost half the session serve and serve return. Now, why is that? I mean, it's not always exciting, but if you serve well, you immediately put your opponent under pressure, okay? And you then get more easier balls to follow up. Plus, if he makes a lot of mistakes on return of serve, you'll play a lot of short points, okay? There'll be a lot of times where he'll just make a mistake points over, or he'll put an easy ball back, you can hit a winner points over. So it's good from the point of view that you can win a lot of cheap points. The rallies will be shorter in a lot of cases. Physically for us who are getting older, that's a good thing. It gives us some weapons. It puts more pressure on the opponent. And of course on the return and serve side, if you return and serve well, you make it more difficult for your opponent to win cheap points. He has to work harder and you then make him basically struggle on his services. So return a serve, being able to stop your opponent winning cheap points and making him earn all his points, important too. So anywhere from a quarter to a half of your training time using serve and serve return would, would be good. Um, as you serve and serve return gets better, it gets easier to actually just use proper serves on any drill and start the drill with a proper serve and a proper serve return. If your return of serve and your serve isn't very good, you may find if you try that, you actually never get to the drill because you're always missing the serve, missing the serve return. So in those sort of cases, you sometimes have to start with a simple serve and you need separate serve practice and serve return practice. Okay, so that's serve, serve return. We've still got some time left. What else will we be looking at? Now, we need to be looking at, I guess, we've all got different styles. But as I mentioned, in that time that I've got left, in that 45 minutes to half an hour, I would be breaking up my time, some to that strength that I want to work on, some to that weakness that I want to work on, and a little bit to my overall type of game. So then again, say if we said, okay, you spent 15 minutes and serve and serve return, I think it would not be... You, you can vary it as you want, but it would not be unreasonable to say, then spend 15 minutes working on your strength, spend 15 minutes working on your... Now when I say strength, I don't necessarily mean your strongest strength, but this, one of your areas of, that are good about your game that you want to improve even further. Maybe you've got a very, very good weapon, forehand loop, and you're wanting to improve your backhand loop as well. Um, and bring that up so that they're both as strong. Well then, that would be what I'd be working on. I'd spend 15 minutes working on my backhand loop. I would then spend 15 minutes working on probably my worst weakness. Um, whatever that may be. Whatever's losing me a lot of points and is getting exploited by my opponents. Um, whether that's my return of serve, whether that's my block against an attack, my push game, um, maybe my opening loop against a backspin ball, um, something like that. Whatever, whatever's losing me a lot of points that I think is the number one thing that will make me play better, that'd be what I'd be working on. So I'd, I'd 15 minutes on that. So we've now come to 45 minutes. What will we do in the last 15? Well, you could do a few different things. I would probably say um, after all of that, single-minded practice. It probably wouldn't hurt to spend the last 15 minutes either playing some games so that you're using all the rest of your strokes and working everything else and hopefully blending those strengths, that strength and that weakness into your game and, and basically bringing them all in so that it's not everything in isolation. You actually do do a little bit of strength work, a little bit of weakness work, then you go to your overall game mode and try to start using them and improve that weakness and improve that strength in gameplay. Or you could maybe do a couple of drills that would work them in some sort of match 
match situation. Or you could just say, well, I'm going to work some of my other aspects of my game just to keep them sharp. I will now work on one of my strengths that I don't think needs as much time and a couple of my other weaknesses or something like that that, again, don't need as much time. Um, but I think usually by that stage, after 45 minutes of heavy practice, trying to play games is probably... 15 minutes of gameplay probably wouldn't hurt. Um, gives you a break lets you use those things in your match and also at the same time will allow you to use all your other strengths and try and improve your other weaknesses in a game situation. I mean we've got limited time, we're trying to make the best use of what we've got. So that would just be a sample, I mean you, you don't have to stick to that religiously. Um, I don't, depending on what I'm doing and how I'm feeling at the time, but it's a nice foundation to, in that limited time, you're covering some essentials that hopefully are going to really make the best difference for your game. Okay, and um, whether they're short term versus long term, should you be using short term weaknesses versus long term weaknesses? Tricky, tricky. Um, I would probably say it's not a bad idea to say if you've got, like we do here, we've got a season, we're at the beginning of the season, it's all the unimportant stuff and you're working towards the end of the season, it's all the important stuff. And you have then a, like an off season. In your off season and at the beginning of the season, work more on those long term things. You know, the things that you need a few months to build up. Then as you start to get into that more competition season where things get important, you can ease back on the long term stuff do more of the short term fixes to your game. You know, if you're two weeks away from your big tournament of the year, now is not the time to be doing major technique work. Now is the time to say, I'm a little bit not so good on this particular return of serve and I'm going to brush that up. So you have to, you know, you have to be intelligent, I guess, in terms of where you are in your season and pick the right type of focus. If you just play year around and um, you're always competing or you never have any real serious competition, then it doesn't matter. Do, do whatever you like, do a little bit of both. Um, but for those of us like myself who have a definite competition season, I'm in my off season at the moment, I'm going to be working more on my long term stuff. You know, with an eye that in another, it's um, November now, that by the time I get to kind of April, where I'm then three months away from my tournament stuff in July, by that stage in April, I'm going to start focusing on more short-term patching the holes, anything that's left that I can find in my game. You know, by April, I don't want to be doing big technique changes at that stage, not with only a few couple of months to go left. You know, so. Just be intelligent how you're going to do that. Okay. Uh, also, just one little mention there, I guess, in terms of um, when you're training in this hour, aggressive versus defensive play. Uh, match it according to your style. So if your strength is a defensive stroke and one of your weaknesses, say, is your attacking put away, that's fine. You know, work still the strength and the weakness. We're working with all different styles here, so it's not a matter of saying, you know, work more on aggressive and less on defensive. It's a matter of saying, well, you know, I stand at the table and really all I do on my back end is just push, you know, and it's strong because I don't miss much and I can vary it a little bit, but my forehand, when I go to attack it, I always miss with my inverted rubber. Well, you know, then that would be what I'd be working on, you know, I'd be... I'd just be keeping my strength going, I'd be working on that weakness. So it's not a matter of saying work to become more aggressive or to become less defensive or vice versa. It's working on what will improve your game um, towards the style that you want to play as well. Now hopefully the style that you want to play is also going to be the style that is most effective for you. But that, that's a matter of taste. Some people may be well suited to play a certain style but they don't like it. So, you know, do you say, well, you know, play the style that suits your build or your capabilities, or play the style that you find you enjoy? 
Well, I would tend to say play the style that you enjoy and try and play it as well as you can. Anyway, enough on that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, intelligent selection in terms of your drills. Uh, yeah. Mm, okay. In terms of the drills, uh, how do you choose good drills to work a strength, or how do you choose a good drill to work a weakness? And the way I tend to recommend on that is to say, firstly, when you're drilling um, either a strength or a weakness, when you're trying to improve something, your first goal is to get your technique solid. Get your technique grooved in so that you can perform the stroke consistently with the same technique in a repetitive manner. Okay, so that, that's your, basically the first task that you need to do. So as an example, let's take a, a quick example, um, say forehand, forehand loop, the basic forehand loop. Our first goal when training this is to make sure that when the ball comes to a certain spot with a certain speed, we can consistently repeat our technique. And also, as I've mentioned in earlier videos, hopefully the technique will be fairly close to ideal technique. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it needs to be fairly close to a technique that is going to get the job done well. Okay? So if you, can, if you can do that, if you can repeat the technique consistently and have fairly, fairly good technique, that's our baseline okay, that we need to be able to do. And off that, I mean off a ball that is consistently coming to the same spot with roughly the same spin. Okay? So the only thing you're trying to do is just repeat, repeat, repeat. If you can't do that, everything else in your drilling is a waste of time. Okay? There's no point going any further. Because until you've got to that point where if that same ball, say a robot was giving it to you, or your training partner is giving you the same shot, if the ball's landing there and you cannot firstly use good technique and you can't do it the same way pretty much every time, if you're doing this, that, 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 okay, you haven't, you haven't, it's no point doing anything more complex until you can get to the point where you can just go there, 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 there. Once you have that, once you have the basic technique grooved in, it is then time to bring in more complexity. The question is, what type of complexity do we want to bring in? Okay. How do we make ourselves work harder and put ourselves under more pressure so that we can use this in a match successfully? Okay. Now, there is a way that I recommend you go about this, and it's, it's more or less the way that I'm going to approach, say, learning that backhand uh, flick with my long pips. But I'll, I'll continue with the forehand loop example here. Now with your forehand loop, um, probably I would recommend starting with a forehand loop against a block. Simply because it's easy for your opponent, your training partner, to block the ball back to the same spot. So that's what we would start with. We would get that technique consistent, ball goes to the same place, and we can consistently do it. Okay, eight or nine times out of ten, we can put it on, put it on, put it on, same spot, and we look pretty, pretty good, and the result is correct. Once we've got to that stage, I would then bring in against, say, the backspin ball, because you're also going to need to loop against backspin. We'll need that, so I do the same thing: the lifting loop, eight or nine times out of ten, doing it successfully. Once I've got those two strokes, where do we go to from there? Well, we start to work our way towards match conditions. And the first thing that I would then do um, is I would introduce the strokes in the order that they're likely to be used in a match. And what is more likely to be used in most of your matches is a loop against backspin to open up your attack off your opponent's push or perhaps off your opponent's serve. So the most likely order is a loop against backspin to begin your attack. 
your opponent blocks the ball and you're now looping against a blocked ball with a little bit of top spin coming back to you. And that would be the most common scenario. So that would be what I'd be saying your next step to work on is, is to have your training partner feed you a push, loop against the push, have your opponent training partner block the ball, and now loop against the block to do it three or four times. Now, does and, and just really until basically you miss or he misses. Now this will mean to a certain extent that your training against the top spin will probably, if you're at all consistent, get a little bit more training than you're training against the underspin. On the other hand, the first loop you always do will be the loop against backspin. So it does mean that if you're looping badly against underspin, you're never going to do a lot of top spin uh, loops against top spin. So it kind of evens out. But that would be my next step. And it would always be to the same location. So the only thing that's changing is he, he pushes the ball, I loop against the backspin, he blocks it, I loop against top spin. So I'm, but I'm creating what I'm going to use in a lot of my matches. Because that's generally what happens in a lot of table tennis matches. You serve a tight serve, your opponent pushes, you loop the push, he blocks, you start to loop against his block or perhaps his counter loop if he goes back and starts to counter loop. Okay. So that's where would be my next step. Having done that, okay, so once you can get to the stage where you can do that successfully 70, 80, 90 percent of the time, we then want to make it another step closer to match conditions. Where I'd probably go to from there is I would actually add, um, say, maybe movement to two positions that I know where the ball's going. So the extra complexity, what we're adding in, is the fact that we're now going to do the strokes and we're going to move, but we do know where the ball's going. So the example would be, say, my opponent pushes the ball to the corner, I loop against the backspin, he blocks the ball to here, I move, I loop against the blocked ball, he now blocks the ball to that corner, I loop, he blocks the ball to here. So it's really just a simple routine of a first push to here, open against the backspin, and then after that your opponent just blocks the ball there, 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 there. So we've, we've made it another step closer to match simulation. We're moving, we're making life a bit harder for ourselves, but because we know where the ball's going, we're not making it too much of a step up. Um, once we can do that and get that successfully, um, I would probably say um, you have two choices at this point. Um, and it doesn't really matter. I don't think it matters a lot which one you do. And as long as you do, if you do one first, you do the other next. And the two choices are really this. Um, you can either, say, add movement to um, random places but to easy random places. So for the example kind of, a, of this forehand loop, I would let my opponent push the ball um, or block the ball anywhere on my forehand, but I would keep him from going to my elbow and I would keep him from going down my backhand line. So I'd keep, basically, I'd let him go in this area where I can go there, here, so that he's not trying to jam me, he's not trying to make my life really, really difficult but of those easy placements, I don't know exactly where it's going to go. Okay? What that does is, if we do that way, what we're getting is we're getting movement to locations we're not sure of, but it's not a really difficult place. So it's not jamming us in our playing elbow or going down the backhand or going super wide on the, the forehand. So we're bringing in a random element but we're not making it too difficult. So it's a small step up. The other option would be to basically bring in, um, keep it fixed so that you know where the ball's going, but have your opponent put it to a difficult spot. And in that case, what we'd be saying is, um, instead of making it all easy locations, I'd get my opponent to maybe put the ball very wide, 
and then put the ball back here. So if I hit that ball there, he comes back so that I now have to really, really work hard. Um, but I know it's going to go wide, it's going to come down here, and I'm going to have to move. Back to wide, back to here. Okay. It's, it's fixed locations, but it's difficult fixed locations. And that's also a step up. Um, they're both, which one of those two that you do, uh, I don't think it matters a lot, but the idea is that whichever one you do first, do the other one after that, and then that kind of leads you to, I guess, your final step, which is using, I guess, um, any placement, you know, um, any positions, and you're, you're basically using open play in that particular respect. So from there, the next step would be um, getting your opponent to try and put it in tough locations when you don't know. So he may go, if you're going to loop this forehand, he may go wide, he may go here, you loop it, he may try for your elbow, and you loop it, and he tries for your elbow again, and then goes wide. And that would be kind of pretty close to your, almost your final step, I guess, in getting into a match condition, because now you don't know where the ball's going, and your opponent is always trying to make you miss now, so you'd be working very, very hard. And probably after that, in terms of this forehand loop stroke, um, the last kind of step would be um, have the opponent mix it in with your backhand you know, and start randomly putting the ball to the backhand side. Um, that's one way to approach it, but that particular step sequence is, is very, very forehand orientated, as you can see. There's, there's nothing also stopping you from saying, OK, Let's make it um, a couple of sets back where we're doing this forehand loop, uh, say, to two positions, here and here, here and here, here and here. Bring in a slightly different random element of here, here, and every so often let your opponent Sorry about that, just running low on my battery. I um, just have to plug in the power cord. Yeah, what I was saying um, before the break was just adding a, a, a slightly different way of also working the forehand drills and adding complexity. Would be, say, where we were talking about having your opponent go here and here, here and here. If you allow your opponent just every five to six shots, he's allowed to put one down your backhand side. So basically you know it's going to come most of the time, 90% of the time, it's going to come here, 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 here. But just once in a while your opponent's going to put one there. So if you're waiting there and he goes there, you may get caught. That's a slightly different random aspect. What that does, that type of thing, it allows you, it, well, it keeps you basically from neglecting being ready for your backhand. And that's another way to approach your drills. But the idea being here is, I guess, that you slowly, slowly build up the complexity to something approaching a match. Okay? So what we try and work on is basically start with the basic technique. Then, once you've mastered the basic technique, add in some movement to places where you know where it's going, to fix locations. Okay? Once you've got the movement to fix locations going, to say for easy fix location, you can start adding in this little bit of random stuff. And when you have a choice of random, there's a lot of choices of random that you can make. But keep it simple, make it only one little random thing. So you can make that, that example that I gave you where it's an occasional random placement that would change it. You could also make it so that it stays here and here and here and here, but your opponent, instead of always pushing the first one and then blocking, 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 you could let him occasionally flick the first one, give you a top spin off the first one. And then after blocking a few, you might let him chop block 
or step back and bring a chop in so that you have to go back against a backspin ball again. Um, again, it's, that one's a variation in spin. So you could vary placement, you could vary spin, um, things like that. But the idea is, is don't ever make the change too big because if you do, you'll probably make it too hard. So small, small changes. Fixed location. Two fixed locations to add movement. Then perhaps either random locations within a small area or stick to fixed locations with an occasional random one over here or a random spin. Then notch it up again. Go to something else. Whatever you're doing there, take one more bit, add another movement element, add another random element. And you're slowly working to, you get to the point where it's, what you're doing is actually fairly close to match play, where you don't really know where the ball is going, you don't always know what spin is on it, you don't know whether the opponent's going this way into your elbow, and your opponent um, is, at the beginning, allowing you, trying to work you so that you get lots of practice, and hopefully by the end he's actually trying to actively make you miss and make you work really, really hard. And that's a sensible progression. Okay? But the idea is basically, yeah, small step-ups in complexity of the drill and hopefully picking a drill that actually mimics as closely as possible what you're going to come up against in a match. Okay? In terms of this forehand drill, the important thing is that most of the time your forehand, first forehand loop is probably going to be against a push. Okay, especially as you get against higher and higher levels. Generally it's going to be against a backspin push. Occasionally a flick, you know, and that's worth working on too. But what we're doing is we're trying to use the best use of our time. So most of the time, work it that you open up against the backspin ball, get the block, and then go to the topspin ball. Okay. A reason why that's important is I've seen a lot of people who can, they'll go straight to the, the old routine of they'll grab the ball, they're working their forehand loop, you know, and they'll grab the ball, they'll serve a top spin ball to the opponent, the opponent blocks it, and straight away they're top spinning. They never did anything against the backspin ball, they didn't really practice opening against it at all. It's not even like they, they served the ball and let their opponent flick, flick it, so they practiced off a flick. They've just basically gone bang. And these are, are quite good players, you know, who already have the basic technique mastered. And all they're really doing is they're reinforcing what they've already got. They're not learning anything new. Um, another example of this being kind of this kind of thing is those players who stand back about two or three metres from the table and grab the ball and just basically grab it. And in order to start a counting loop rally, they just basically start with a loop motion. Now, if you're terrible at counter-looping, that's a good way to train, to begin with, because it allows you to get straight into the counter-looping routine. But once you've learned the basic counter-loop and how to perform it, you better start bringing in the bit that gets you, how do you get from up close to the table to back here, suddenly counter-looping? You've got to bring in the steps in the chain, so you'd have to start working on that and bringing in how to do that too. Um, for most of us, probably that's not quite so much to worry about. Um, there's not going to be a lot of us who are actually looking to be counter-looping well back from the table. But it's a good example of um, something that if you only ever did that, you'd get good at counter-looping from back at the table, but because you'd never actually be able to play a lot of the rally beginning of the rally, you'd never actually get to that stage. So it's, it's time, kind of a useless practice and one that I was guilty of doing. Okay, now, that's I guess a little bit of in terms of bringing the drill, how to bring a drill up. Also there is, in terms of intelligent training, there's off-table training and you can make intelligent use of your off-table training. Now, for most people um, who are doing this course, I'm, I'm well aware that um, the vast majority are probably not going to really do any off-table training, and that's perfectly fine. You've only got so much time, um, it can be quite boring as well. Um, so, you know, that's, I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm saying, however, if you do want to do it, um, 
bear in mind, try and train stuff in your, in your time that you have. Try and train things that are going to help your table tennis game. Okay? And by that, take a look at what you're doing. Um, an example of what I did last year was I did a lot of fitness work. Um, a lot of aerobic fitness work last year, which meant that I could actually play all day aerobically, no problems. Um, the problem was that when I got to the nationals this year, um, it wasn't aerobically that I had the problem, it was all my legs aching from all these long rallies. And what I had done is I had trained a lot of aerobic fitness without bending my legs too much. So aerobically, yeah, I could play all day. But when it came to all the, the leg bending, bend, bend, I, didn't, I hadn't trained enough of that and gee did I ache. I was so sore. Um, so if I was going to defend this year, I would really have to work a lot more on leg strength, being able to bend and bend. Um, the problem is, of course, I've got um, quite sore knees, so I don't think that's really going to be a viable option. So that's why I'm not playing that style anymore. So this coming year, in terms of my physical fitness, I will still do a lot of aerobic work because I want to be fit. Um, you know. So I won't neglect it, and I do need to drop a bit more weight again. I'm not going to be doing a lot of extensive leg bending work because this style doesn't require quite the, the depth of bend that my chopping style does. But I'm going to do a little bit more than I did because I still do want to get low and wide, and I want to make sure that my legs are strong. So I will be bringing in some squats with my weights um, probably some leg extensions maybe to help the front of the knee and th things like that. Leg curls for the um, back of the leg. And, you know, basically, um, I want to make sure my legs don't ache, so I will, I'm going to play a style that's more forgiving, but I'm also going to do a bit of strength work with weights to build up the leg strength. Um, so, again, you know, if you've got time, try and do stuff if you're, if you're getting tired by the end of the day. More aerobic work. If you're aching somewhere, try and do something to strengthen that or maybe avoid it in your style, improve your technique to take it, take the stress out. A good example being if your shoulder aches a lot. Usually if your shoulder is aching a lot, it means that you're using your shoulder and arm too much, you're not using your waist and legs enough. So if you actually start using your waist and legs more, you'll take a lot of stress off your shoulder. Um, in that case, a technique change will actually probably do a lot more work than trying to lift lots of weight with weights with your arm to build up your shoulder. So improve the technique and you can still get good results. But yeah, basically in your off-table work, try and do some things if you have the time that are going to benefit your table tennis game. Uh, being aerobically fit never hurts. Um, having good strong legs never, never hurts. Bearing in mind that also table tennis is quite a stop-start type of game, I'm doing short sprints and then a brief rest and a sprint and a brief rest, that kind of thing would also probably be um, quite useful as well. Uh, finally, um, tactically in terms of intelligent training, should you train patterns when you're trying to do your training? Um, yeah. I don't think that would hurt at all to actually um, pick a few patterns that you've decided this is what I want to um, I want to try and work this particular this serve he returns I hit that shot he does this I do that um, probably any pattern that's more than about three of your own strokes is probably getting a bit long and complicated uh, so I tend to use a favourite pattern of mine for example is a three stroke pattern on my end which is a pendulum side spin serve back spin side spin get the return to my backhand roll it with the long pips to get it to roll over make, him a, make my opponent hesitate make the ball wobble a little bit in the air and it bounces sideways so that I get a weak return that I can then top spin from this side or twiddle a top spin from that side and that's a favourite pattern of mine that I've trained a lot. And that's probably, again, it's three strokes from me, a serve, a setup, and a put away. 
anything much longer than that and it's not going to be likely you're going to use it a lot in a match. So two strokes set up, three strokes set up so are pretty, pretty good. So those kind of patterns, definitely, yeah, go ahead and work those um, in your match. You may want to do that at the last 15 minutes to work a few patterns. Or if you're going to try and use it with a strength, say your strength is your forehand put away, work that in. You know, serve, roll it, forehand put away. And that way you're training this stroke, but training and pattern at the same time. And if you can do that, if you can do two things at once, well, that's more effective use of your time. However, you need to have the basics. There's no point in me trying to train that if I cannot hit a decent forehand, if my basic forehand technique is bad. So you have to get things good enough so that your, my forehand technique against a moving ball has to be good enough so that I can serve, roll it, and hit it from there or maybe hit it from here. Okay? If my technique's not good enough, it's not the right drill for me yet. Okay, so yeah, tactically, working patterns is, is an intelligent use of your time. How many patterns? Well, <laughs> not, not probably 30 of them, but a, a handful. You know, if we're talking maybe three to five patterns to start with is a good start and see how you go from there. You know, or just one or two to begin with, trying to work up to three to five patterns. All right, having done all that and talked about all that, We've, we've worked out, we've got our time, we've worked out some training routines, perhaps some drills depending on where we are, and we've worked out a few drills. Once you've done that and you've done all this training, you then have to, in your matches, you have to get on court and try and use it. There's, there's no point doing this in training and not doing it in the match. Okay? Don't wait. Okay? The important thing, I guess, is what I'm saying is, don't wait until you're perfect in training to start trying to use it in matches. Okay? Just go ahead and start trying to use it in your matches because that's the perfect time to get your feedback on how well you're going. Okay? If you've got a really crucial match coming up okay, that you can't afford to lose, then all right, you may not want to do it there and then. Okay? But if you've got those sort of matches coming up, you probably shouldn't be working on um, big changes, there should only be little changes anyway, little quick fixes um, to bring in. But nonetheless, I still think it's important to try and, as soon as possible, start using these things in a match situation, because that's going to be your very best feedback to tell you whether what you're doing, what you're training, and how you're trying to train it, whether it's working. Okay, Give you straight away feedback. Based off that feedback, then you can say, well, is what I'm doing working or not working? Or is it working just okay? You can then try and say, well, okay, if it's, if it's working really well, keep going. If it's working okay, well, all right, try and see something that you can improve, something tweaking, minor changes to try and make it work even better. If it's not working at all, well, you need to look, go back and, and check out maybe... Um, Maybe what you're working on isn't what really happens in a match. So it's not really training you for the match situation. Maybe you're training the wrong thing. You're working on the wrong weakness. And um, they're, they're actually beating you with something else. So if those are the situations, then you've got to basically, having made a plan, you're going to try it out, then you're going to take that feedback and try and improve your plan. Okay? Uh, Another thing that I'd probably just mention, and just a couple of things just to finish off with, is firstly, um, always be aware of the law of diminishing returns, both on training your strengths and training your weaknesses. Now, by that, what I simply mean is that if you've got a strength, okay, that's something that you're very good at, okay, and you're already quite, you know, so you're already quite good at it, training that a lot more may only improve it by a very small amount. You may be a lot better off taking your second best strength and spending the time on that because you may be able to prove that a lot more than a strength that's already very, very good. So maybe working the second best thing may be easier to improve 
then improving your best thing just a little bit. Okay? That's one aspect of the, the law of diminishing returns. The other thing would be, of course, um, if you've got a weakness, if there's something you're bad at, you're usually bad at it for a reason. It's, there's something, you know, you're not, either your grip is wrong, your footwork's wrong, or, or whatever, or you maybe just have no real talent for that particular stroke or that aspect of the game. So bear in mind that although when you're working on that weakness, you may be able to get it up to the point where it's, it's not terribly, terribly bad, it's just kind of average. At that point, that may be as much as you want to do. Because to get it from sort of mediocre average up until where it's good may take too much work. And it may be better, actually, if you've got something that's very bad and something that's kind of, um, you know, your second worst thing is about here, once you've got the very bad thing up, you know, to maybe, you know, mediocre, don't keep working on that one. Go to this other one and bring that up to mediocre and you may find you'll get better use of your time. And what it really is is we're just saying, look, you know, you've only got so much time. Always be aware of, is this thing, once you've covered that weakness up to the point where it's not so bad, go to what else is weaker, bring that up as well. Because you're never going to make them strengths, you know, but it's, it's silly to try and take a weakness all the way up to a strength when you could bring it up to average and then bring another weakness up. Because hopefully you're not going to use them much anyway. You know, you're just trying to cover the holes so you don't get exploited. Okay? But that, that's another aspect of diminishing returns. And really the final thing I'll mention in terms of training intelligently um, in this particular part is a little saying that sort of like I picked up somewhere around the traps and I, I think is good advice for anybody, but I'm not going to take credit for it. Um, but the saying is basically to train, train hard, but play easy. Okay? Or I, I read about it the other day. Someone mentioned it the other day. I saw it on a site somewhere, which is um, you know, basically when you're training, think hard. When you're playing, don't think too much. Uh, you know, training is where you do the hard work. You know, it's where the thinking goes on, all the hard work goes in, so that when you come match day, you don't have to think too much and you can just play and you can let things flow. And you don't have to think about your technique. You can think about tactical stuff, what's going on in the match. So you do all that training on, am I training, I'm training, is my technique right? Is my technique right? Am I moving correctly? So when you get in a match, you don't think about that stuff. You can think about, what is my opponent doing? Is he strong there? Is he weak there? What's going on? Okay, so train hard, think hard in training, Play allows you to play easy and focus on what's going on rather than having to think about yourself too much. Okay? But I think that's probably a, a good start in terms of um, my training philosophy, how I try and make the very best use of my time. Um, if anybody's got a little bit more um, specifics about how I'm going to build up my training program, um, I may, well, I, I may do it anyway. I may come back and just actually... Um, when I finalise everything, I'll come back and show you the training program that I'm going to use. Um, I think that would probably, obviously, won't apply to everybody, but it will show you a practical example of a, a training program. So I, I still think I'll, I'll come and do that a bit later so that you can basically see how I'm going to take these principles and actually really apply them um, for my own training. So, um, yeah, that will still be to, to come. But, Again, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Um, I hope you got something out of it. Um, and uh, there'll be more videos to come. So, thank you.